Good evening. This is our diving deeper into January 5th, Genesis 11 through 13, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 20, Psalm 5, and Psalm 91. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious time that we have to get together and to dive deeper into your word. I ask that you give us the discernment to decipher what message that you want us to convey through the words in your word, in your book, in the Bible. I invite the Holy Spirit in to guide me and to take control of what I say, how I say, how to, how I deliver, and that I say exactly what you want me to say for the specific reasons that you want me to say. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, for another day of breath for all the provisions that you provide. I'm very thankful for sunshine. I'm thankful for health. Thank you for our health. We praise you and we ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds for this time to that we are to dive deeper into your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, this is Diving Deeper for January 5th, Genesis 11 through 13. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, my notes that I have in my Bible, um, Genesis 11, verse 3. The brick used to build this tower, which is the Tower of Babel, uh, was man-made and not as hard as stone. The Tower of Babel was most likely a ziggurat, <clears throat> a common structure in Babylonia at this time, most often built as temples. Ziggurats looked like, like pyramids with steps or ramps leading up the sides. Ziggurats stood as high as 300 feet and were often just as wide. Thus, they were the focal point in the city. The people in this story built their tower as a monument to their own greatness, something for the whole world to see. Do you ever do that? Are you building something for humans? Are you building something for recognition through man? The Tower of Babel was a great human achievement, a wonder of the world, but it was a monument to the people themselves rather than to God. We may build monuments ourselves, expensive clothes, big house, fancy car, important job, to call attention to our achievements. These may not be wrong in themselves, but when you use them to give us identity and self-worth, they take God's place in our lives. Do you find your identity in your work, in your clothes, in your hair, your skin, um, your makeup, uh, what does it say, uh, your big house, your fancy car, your important job, do you find your identity in that rather than in Christ? We are free to develop in many areas, but we are not free to think that we have replaced God. What towers have you built in your life? In chapter 9, Verses 24 through 27, we read Noah's curse on Canaan. Ham's son, uh, chapter 10, verse 6, ancestor of the evil Canaanites. Here and in 10, 22 through 31, we have a list of Shem's descendants. We were blessed, 9, 26. From Shem's line came Abram and the entire Jewish nation, which would eventually conquer the land of Canaan in the days of Joshua. I feel like I've read this in another video, but that's okay. We can do this again. Because um, I think this 
is one of the pages that I held up for you, but if not, there you go, the map. And I show you these things when I do these videos because, I mean, we could dive deeper and we could talk about so many different things in each chapter, in each book, each time that we get on the video, and we could cover so many things. Um, but I add things for you if you want to dive deeper or at a different time, if you want to come back and watch this video and um, you're at a different place in your life that you were today when you watched it and you want to dive deeper into something else that is relative to your life at that point, um, I just try to add as much as possible for you to be able to do that. The Tower of Babel, the plains between the Tigris and Euphrates River offered a perfect location for the city and tower that reaches to the heavens, which is exactly the map that I just showed you. Abram grew up in Ur of the Chaldeans, an important city in the ancient world. Archaeologists have discovered evidence of a flourishing civilization there in Abram's day. The city carried on an extensive trade with its neighbors and had a vast library. Growing up in Ur, Abram was probably well-educated. Terah left Ur to go to Canaan, but settled in Haran instead. Why did he stop halfway? It may have been his health, the climate, or even fear. But this did not change Abram's calling. The Lord said to Abram in chapter 12, verse 1, he had respect for his father's leadership. But when Terah died, Abram moved on to Canaan. God's will may come in stages, just as the time of Haran was a trans transition period for Abram. So God may give us transition periods and times of waiting to help us depend on him and trust his timing. If we patiently do this, do his will during the transition times, we will be better prepared to serve him as we should when he calls us. Do you have waiting periods in your life? have you figured out what those waiting periods are? What happens when God says, I want you to wait? This is a time for you to listen, to um, rest, to reprieve, to um, just wait. Um, I think that I figured out when God wants me to wait uh, in my life and what happens when he says, stop. Um, it's happened a few times in my life. So I think that I figured that out to where I try to listen and I try to slow down. I try to say, what am I supposed to do, Lord? What, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to learn? Um, how am I supposed to grow through this? And asking the questions so I know what to do. Mm, I hate when I do that when I start talking and I forget where I left off at. Uh, let's see. I already read that. Oh, okay. Um, when God called him, Abram moved out in faith from Ur to Haran and finally to Canaan. God then established a covenant with Abram, telling him that he would found a great nation. Not only would this nation be blessed, God said, but the other nations of the earth would be blessed through Abram's descendants. Israel, the nation that would come from Abram, was to follow God and influence those with whom it came in contact. Through Abram's family tree, Jesus Christ was born to save humanity. Through Christ, people can have a personal relationship with God and be blessed beyond measure. God promised to bless Abram and make him great, but there was one condition. Abram had to do what God wanted him to do. 
This meant leaving his home and friends and traveling to a new land where God promised to build a great nation with Abram's family. Abram obeyed, walking away from his home for God's promise of even greater blessing in the future. God may be trying to lead you to a place of greater service and usefulness for him. Don't let the comfort and the security of your present position make you miss God's plan for you. Abram's journey to Canaan. Abram, Sarai, and Lot traveled from Ur of the Chaldeans of to Canaan by way of Haran. Though indirect, this route followed the rivers rather than attempting to cross the vast desert. That was probably smart on their part. Here's another map. Okay. Okay. Uh, now we're into chapter 12. Oh, we were already in chapter 12. Um, continuing chapter 12. God planned to develop a nation of people he would call his own. He called Abram from the godless, self-centered city of Ur to a fertile region called Canaan, where a God-centered moral nation could be established. Though small in dimension, the land of Canaan was the focal point for most of the history of Israel, as well as for the rise of Christianity. The small land given to one man, Abram, has had a tremendous impact on world history. Abram built an altar to the Lord. Altars were used in many religions. Now this says in many religions. I don't know if that means following Christ because following Christ is not a religion in my book I think that like Catholicism bap, uh, being a Baptist um, Lutheran I think those are religions um, I don't think of Christianity as a religion I feel like it's a spiritual it's a relationship with Christ um, so I wonder what that means that um, altars were used in many religions. Again, I'm not a scholar, so I don't know everything about the Bible. I'm sure that means something. Um, I'm sure that somebody that knows more than me that's listening to this is going, well, duh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know. I don't know everything. So I'm trying to learn more. That's why I'm doing this Bible study is I'm trying to learn and grow. And... um. But for God's people, altars were more than places of sacrifice. For them, altars symbolized communion with God and commemorated notable encounters with him. So they had to go to this specific place to have an encounter with God on these specific altars. Built of rough stones and earth Altars are often remained in place for years as continual reminders of God's protection and promises. Abram regularly built altars to God for two reasons, for prayer and worship. Now, I, I pray all the time, no matter where I'm at. I will... I just gave a lady a hug and prayed with her right then and there um, the other day. I, I don't have a specific prayer room, prayer spot, prayer. I don't have a specific any any altar that I go to um, for prayer. Um, I do come to my office for Bible study time. I do have, I have designated this quiet corner of the house as my place where I do my Bible study. Maybe that would be considered an altar. Um, as reminders of God's promise to bless him, Abram couldn't survive spiritually without regularly renewing his love and loyalty to God. Now, I do agree with the regular um, communication with Christ 
to keep our relationship. If I go too long without it, then I start drifting towards my flesh and making decisions on my own and making mistakes and decisions that might not be what they would have if I were seeking Christ in that decision making. As reminders of God's promise to bless him. All right, I already read that. Um, remember that God was the center of his life. Regular worship helps us remember. So worship is different acts. It depends on what your relationship is with Christ, what your worship is. Um, that's between you and him. Remember what God desires and motivates us to obey him. When famine struck, Abram went to Egypt where there was food. Why would there be a famine in the land where God had just called Abram? This was a test of Abram's faith, and Abram passed. He didn't, pardon me, he didn't question God's leading when facing this difficulty, many believers find that when they determine to follow God, they immediately encounter, encounter great obstacles. The next time you face such a test, don't try to second guess what God is doing. Now, I don't know if I agree with that. Um, and I don't mean second guess. I mean, I think it's okay to question God. I think that it's okay to ask him why he might not give us answers to what we're looking for or we might have to wait for that answer. But I think it's okay to say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. Why, why would you do that? Um, I think questioning so you understand, not questioning like you know better than God. I mean, I don't think I know better than God, but I like to understand things and I like to um, try to discern and the more information that I have, the better that I can say, okay, I, I, I do believe that. I do um, feel that's the right thing to do or that it's not the right thing to do or whatever when asking questions. And I think it's okay with asking questions. Um, use the, int <laughs> I say this, I say this often, use intelligence, um, the intelligence God gave you, use the brain that God gave you, use it. Um, don't just have somebody tell you what to do or how to do or what's right or what's wrong what within your spirit is right? What within your spirit is wrong? You make a decision and stand by it and live by it. And as Abram did when he temporarily moved to Egypt and wait for new opportunities. Sometimes it's hard to listen, just to stop and listen to God and hear what he's saying. Um, I really, really try to stop and listen. Sometimes we hear, but we don't listen. And um, I'm really working on hearing and listening to what God is saying and try to obey Um, Abram, acting out of fear, asked Sarai to tell a half-truth by saying she was his sister. She was his half-sister, but she was also his wife. I had a few thoughts on Abram, and that's exactly what I was thinking of when I was reading it in the first video of that, why was Abram fearful? If he had such a great relationship with Christ, why was he so fearful that these men would 
hurt him to get to Sarai. And um, it just reminded me that we are human. We do make mistakes. We do do things in fear. We do make decisions based on what we think is the right decision without considering God. And that's when we get into trouble or other people into trouble, as Abram did numerous times. Abram's intent was to deceive the Egyptians. And that was another thing that it's like, I think he was a bit mischievous, Abram. He, his intent was to deceive. He feared that if they knew the truth, they would kill him and get Sarai. I'm almost wondering if it wasn't a game knowing that he had such a special relationship with God that he kind of messed with people. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I have a sense of humor. I like to mess with people. Um, maybe he didn't think it was that big of a deal until it was a big deal. And then he was like, oh, sorry. Um <laughs> She would have been a desirable addition to Pharaoh's harem because of her wealth, beauty, and potential for political alliance. As Sarai, Sarai's brother, Abram, would, would have been given a place of honor. As her husband, however, his life would be in danger because Sarai could not enter Pharaoh's harem unless Abram was dead. So Abram lost faith in God's protection. Even after all God had promised him and told the half truth. Well, half truth is a lie. A lie is a lie. So um, there's my literal thinking again. It's not half truth. It's a lie. A lie is a lie. A lie is not a half truth. It's a lie. Period. It's deceitful. And he was deceitful. He was purposely deceitful because he didn't trust God to protect him. And didn't trust God to take care of that particular situation. And look where it got him. Look where it got Pharaoh. Um, this shows how lying compounds the effects of sin. When he lied, Abram's problems multiplied. When we lie, they snowball. Um, Abram's journey to Egypt. A famine could cause the loss of a shepherd's wealth. So Abram traveled through the Negev to Egypt where there was plenty of food and good land for his flocks. And here's another map. Of his journey. Okay. In Abram's day, sheep and cattle owners could acquire great wealth. Abram's wealth not only included silver and gold, but also livestock. These animals were a valuable commodity used for food, clothing, tent material, and sacrifices. They were often traded for other goods and services. Abram was able to watch his wealth grow and multiply daily. Facing a potential conflict with his nephew Lot, Abram took the initiative in settling the dispute. He gave Lot first choice, even though Abram, being older, had the right to choose first. Abram also showed a willingness to risk being cheated. Abram's example shows us how to respond to difficult family situations. Number one, take the initiative in resolving conflicts. Number two, let others have first choice, even if it means not getting what we want. Number three, put family peace above personal desires. How many of you have family drama? Who doesn't have family drama? I know I do, and I have pretty much my whole life. Still today, I have family drama. Facing a potential con... Oh, I already read that. Oh, my goodness. 
surrounded by hostile neighbors, a the herdsmen of Abram and Lot should have pulled together. Instead, they let petty jealousy tear them apart. Similar situations exist today. Christian, Christians often bicker while Satan is at work all around them. How many times have we bickered while Satan does his work and we're sitting here bickering? Rivalries, arguments, and disagreements among believers can be destructive in three ways. Number one, they damage goodwill, trust, and peace. The foundations of good human relations. Goodwill, trust, and peace. Is that not the truth? You trust another person for their good will, their good intentions towards you. Have they broken their trust? Have they kept their trust? And peace. Oh my gosh, I have asked for peace in my life for the past, I don't know. I've gotten so tired over the last mm, probably 50, no, like 10. 10 years or so, um, some pretty drastic things have happened in my life that are devastating to me and I'm tired and, um, one thing I've asked God is I just want peace. I'm so tired. I'm so tired of fighting. I'm so tired of being hurt. I'm so tired of, um, fighting and I'm so tired of other people not fighting for what they should or fighting against what they shouldn't. <sighs> Peace. It's so important in a relationship. And just be, we have a, a sign in our store, be a good human. Just be a good human. Number two, they hamper progress towards important goals. Do you have anybody in your life that hinders your goals that don't, don't support your goals, that um, deter you from your goals. Um, probably time to sit down and either talk with them and get on the same page or they need to go. They make us self-centered rather than love-centered. Jesus understood how destructive arguments among brothers could be. In his final prayer before being betrayed and arrested, Jesus asked God that his followers be one. John 17 verse 21. We're supposed to be one people, guys. And the last couple of years, 2020, 2021, there's been so much division it's just, I mean, I know that, you know, people have always been divided over, you know, whatever. But the last couple of years, it's crazy. It's absolutely mind-blowing crazy, the things that have divided people in the last couple of years. And for whatever reasons that the people don't see what destruction is being done, is mind blowing to me too. So, um, so we just pray. We pray. We pray for community. We pray for one. We pay. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for solitude. We pray for people's eyes to be open so they can see what they're causing or what they're going through or, um whatever that the situation is that is not positive is not beneficial is not trustworthy is not um goodwill towards other men um what else it's not causing peace <sighs> that that um concludes my um diving deeper into Genesis 11 through 13. Add any comments, um, additions, questions, thoughts, 
um, that you would like. Private message me if you want to talk about anything. Um, if you need a Bible, let me know. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, let me know. I'm going to pop over to Matthew 5, 1 through 20. That's over here. Move one of my 5 million pairs of readers. I gotta find my red ones. I got some really cool red ones. I really like these. I'm digging these lately, but I have some that are like, um, like, uh, what a tortoise, um, like this that are, that I was wearing earlier. I have them everywhere, <laughs> but I'm digging these. So you've probably seen these more so than any others. So I'm digging these lately. Matthew 5, 1 through 20. So I need to go. Ooh. Lots of notes on Matthew 5. Matthew 5 through 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus gave it on a hillside near Capernaum. This sermon probably covered several days of preaching. In it, Jesus proclaimed his attitude towards the law. Position, authority, and money are not important in his kingdom. Did you hear that? Position, authority, and money are not important in his kingdom. What matters is faithful obedience from the heart. The Sermon on the Mount challenged the proud, the legalistic religious leaders of the day. It called them back to the message of the Old Testament prophets who, like Jesus, taught that heartfelt obedience is more important than legalistic observance. Enormous crowds were following Jesus. He was the talk of the town and everyone wanted to see him. The disciples, who were the closest associates of this popular man, were certainly tempted to feel important, proud, and possessive. Being with Jesus gave him not only prestige, but also opportunity for receiving money and power. The crowds were gathering once again, but before speaking, to them, Jesus pulled his disciples aside and warned them about the temptations they would face as his associates. Don't expect fame and fortune, Jesus was saying, but mourning, hunger, and persecution. Nevertheless, Jesus assured his disciples they would be rewarded, but perhaps not in this life. There may be times when Following Jesus will bring us great popularity. If we don't live by Jesus' words in, the, in this sermon, we will find ourselves using God's message only to promote our personal interests. Jesus began his sermon with words that seem to contradict each other, but God's way of living usually contradicts the world's. If you want to live for God, you must be ready to say and do what seems strange to the world. You must be willing to give when others take, to love when others hate, to help when others abuse. By giving up your own rights in order to serve others, you will one day receive everything God has in store for you. There are at least four ways to understand the Beatitudes. Number one, they are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. Two, they contrast kingdom values, what is eternal, with worldly values, which is temporary or what is temporary. Number three, they contrast the superficial faith of the Pharisees with the real faith Christ wants. Four, they show how the Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the new kingdom. These beatitudes are not multiple choice. Pick what you like and leave the rest. 
they must be taken as a whole. They describe what we should be like as Christ's followers. Each beatitude tells how to be blessed. Blessed means more than happiness. It implies the fortunate or inviolable state of those who are in God's kingdom. The Beatitudes don't promise laughter, pleasure, or earthly prosperity. To Jesus, blessed means the experience of hope and joy, independent of outward circumstances. Blessed means the ex experience of hope and joy, independent of outward circumstances. So no matter your circumstances. To find hope and joy, the deepest form of happiness, follow Jesus no matter what the cost. With Jesus' announcement that the kingdom was near, people were naturally asking, how do I qualify to be in God's kingdom? Jesus said that God's kingdom is organized differently from worldly kingdoms. In the kingdom of heaven, wealth and power and authority are unimportant. Kingdom people seek different blessings and benefits, and they have different attitudes. Are your attitudes a carbon copy of the world, world selfishness, pride, and lust for power? Or do they reflect the humility and self-sacrifice of Jesus, your king? Jesus said to rejoice when we are persecuted. Oof, how hard is that? To thank him in the storm. To praise him in the storm. I look at it. I'm not perfect. I don't always praise him in the storm. But. During those hard times, I thank him and I try to open my mind to what am I supposed to learn from this? What am I supposed to grow through this? Um, and that he knows so much better than I do. And that I trust him with my life the hardest the absolute hardest thing that I ever did I didn't do it until Mercedes left the house my oldest daughter I didn't I didn't do it until then and that she was I think she was 17 she wasn't 18 yet 17 years old my baby my firstborn 17 years old I I gave my kids to God, but I didn't really. I lent them. <laughs> um, but when Mercedes left and that devastation happened, I really had to trust God that he was going to take care of her no matter what. And I had to go through prayer and my face on the ground to what the heck was going on and how was I supposed to respond to the situation? How was I supposed to handle the situation? That's, that's where my trust in God was tested the most. Our children, my children. And then Try to talk about this stuff without crying. And then my son, devastation. With my son, and that was another learning, growing, painful lesson in trusting God through it all and giving my children to God. Like wholeheartedly giving them to God as we should have in the womb. But I was a little late to the game, but 
Um, today, I trust God 150% with my family, um, my children, my marriage, my life, uh, my finances, um, my little baby Xander. Um, God is on his throne. He is in control. And I trust him explicitly. Jesus said to rejoice when we're persecuted. It's not always easy to do that. I'm going to tell you right now. I know it is not easy. Persecution can be good because, number one, it takes your eyes off of earthly rewards. Two, it strips away superficial beliefs. Three, it strengthens the faith of those who endure it. It did strengthen my faith. The things that I've endured in my life have strengthened my faith. Um, I, I can attest to that. That is, that is true. Um, number four, our attitude through it serves as an example to others who follow. We can be comforted to know that God's greatest prophets were persecuted. Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel, the fact that we are being persecuted proves that we have been faithful. Faithless people would be unnoticed. In the future, God will reward the faithful by receiving them into his eternal kingdom where there is no more persecution. If a seasoning has no flavor, it has no value. If Christians make no effort to affect the world around them, we are worthless. Christians should not blend in with everyone else. That's my thing. I do not want to blend in. I want to stand out. And not in a bad way, in a good way. I don't want to be um, a sore thumb, an eyesore. I don't, I don't want to be a troublemaker. I don't want to be a negative Nelly. I want to stand out where someone sees me and says, what? Whatever she's got, I want. What she's different. What what's so different about her? Um, I have strived to be different, and um, it's not always easy. Um, I know we talked about that in um, a past video that this path is is narrow. It's lonely. Um, not everybody wants to take this path, and um, it's not always easy. It's just not. Okay, <laughs> got to get better at this. Let's see. Oh, okay. Um, we are worthless. Christians should not blend in with any or everyone else. There's so many of us that do blend in. That when you find out there that, oh, I'm a Christian. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Don't blend in. Stand out where there's no question that you are a Christ follower. Stand out. Instead, we should affect others positively. Positively, not negatively. Positively. Just as seasoning brings out the best flavor in food. Isn't that the truth? When something isn't seasoned properly, it's just like bleh. And then when you just add a little bit of seasoning, it's like, ooh, that's pretty darn good. And then you add a little more seasoning, it's like, wow. Okay, perfection. <laughs> I like me my food. Can you hide a city that is sitting on top of a hill? Its light at night can be seen for miles. If we live for Christ, we will glow like lights showing others what Christ is like. We hide our light by, number one, being quiet when we should speak. Have you ever been quiet when you should have spoken? Have you ever kept your mouth shut in a situation where you should have spoken up? Number two, actually, let me go back a bit. Have you ever been in a situation where you've spoken up and you should not have spoken up? I have no problem speaking up. <laughs> now, not speaking. 
that has been a journey for me, not speaking. Going along with the crowd. Do you go along with the crowd? Denying the light. Do you, are you on the fence? Are you, um, you know what the right thing is to do, but then you're, you kind of, well, you know, my friends, you know, do it or my family is telling me to do it, you know, whatever. Um, and then you deny the light and kind of cover your light from pressure, outward pressure. Number four, letting sin dim our light. Continually doing things that take you away from shining your light. Number five, not explaining our light to others. I struggle with that. I don't owe anybody anything. I don't owe you a thing. I don't feel I owe you anything. So that is where I have a problem with, well, I don't have to explain anything to you. I don't owe you anything. My my most important relationship is with my God. And then after that is my family. And then beyond that, it's like, I don't owe you anything. You don't owe me anything. I don't owe you anything. I struggle with that. To whereas I could take the time to explain to others my light and why and how and um, for, you know, whatever reasons in whatever situation. It's like, I don't have to. I don't want to. You don't need me to. You don't want me to. And this is me saying, you know, about the situation or, or you know, whatever. I, I struggle with that. Not telling people about uh, not explaining my light. Um, I think, I think I struggle with that. Number six, ig ignoring the needs of others. Woo! Other people's needs. We are so busy that we don't even see the needs of other people anymore. Now, in 2020 and 2021, now so many people are afraid of everyone else. They'll breathe on me. They'll, you know, I'll get sick. Um, that you don't even allow the opportunity to be able to minister to other people's needs because there's other things that are coming in fear and lies and whatever else where you don't see other people's needs. Be a beacon of truth. Don't shut your light off from the rest of the world. God's morals and ceremonial laws were given to help people love God with all their hearts and minds. Throughout Israel's History, however, these laws have been often misquoted and misapplied. By Jesus' time, religious leaders had turned the laws into a confusing mass of rules. I feel like we have that today, too. All of the laws that we have going on that have been put on the books by dishonest and, and just plain evil people where it's like, oh my God, it's so confusing, all of the laws that we have to or should or shouldn't live by or abide by in today's society. When Jesus talked about a new way to understand God's law, he was actually trying to bring people back to its original purpose. Jesus did not speak against the law itself, but against the abuses and the excesses to which it had been subjected. I feel like we're dealing with that today as well, that they're abused, they're in excess of for gain of opposite of God's will. And it also says, see John 1, 17 in regards to that. 
if Jesus did not come to abolish the law, does that mean all the Old Testament laws still apply to us today? In the Old Testament, there were three categories of law, ceremonial, civil, and moral. Number one, the ceremonial law related specifically to Israel's worship. See Leviticus 1, 2, and 3, for example. Its primary purpose was to point forward to Jesus Christ. These laws, therefore, were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. While we are no longer bound by ceremonial laws, the principles behind them to worship and love a holy God still apply. Jesus was often accused by the Pharisees of violating ceremonial law. The civil law applied to daily living in Israel. See Deuteronomy 24, 10, and 11. For example, because modern society and culture are so radically different from that time and setting, all of these guidelines cannot be followed specifically. But the principles behind the commands are timeless and should guide our conduct. Jesus demonstrated these principles by example. Three, the moral law such as the Ten Commandments, is the direct command of God, and it requires strict obedience. See Exodus 20 and 13, for example. The moral law reveals the nature and will of God, and it still applies today. Jesus obeyed the moral law completely. Some of those in the crowd were, let's see, yep, I'm, these are still notes for five. Some of the loads, some of those in the crowd were experts at telling others what to do. I do not like being told what to do by anybody. I don't care. I don't care who it is. And I don't like seeing other people bully other people in them telling other people what they have to do it just that's that's a trigger for me it's like who are you hello um but they missed the central point of god's law themselves Jesus made it clear, however that obeying god's law is more important than explaining it so there's some people out there that are so busy explaining what people should and shouldn't do that they're forgetting about how important it is to explain what we should be doing with a kind heart, a loving heart, a educational moment, a learning moment rather than It is much easier to study God's laws and tell others to obey them than to put them to into practice. How are you doing at obeying God yourself? How are you doing? Um, I try to obey God every single day. I fail every single day, but I try every single day. I'm human, I have human flaws, I have triggers that, you know, some days I'm, I'm really good at keeping control of my anger and frustration and disappointment and, you know, whatever. And then other days it's like, whoa, where did that Shannon come from? Um, why, why did you, you know, and I'm talking to myself, why did you react that way? Why did you say that? Why did you do that? So it's a daily, it's a daily, 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 daily. The Pharisees were exacting and scrupulous in their attempts to follow their laws. So how could Jesus reasonably call us to a greater righteousness than theirs? The Pharisees' weakness 
was that they were content to obey the laws outwardly without allowing God to change their hearts or attitudes. Jesus was saying, therefore, that the quality of our goodness should be greater than that of the Pharisees. They looked po poious, but they were far from the kingdom of God. God judges our hearts as well as our deeds, for it is in the heart that our real allegiance lies. Be just as concerned about your attitude that people don't see as about your actions that are all seen by all. I definitely can have an attitude. I definitely, um, that's something I struggle with. I think that kind of stems from that I don't owe you anything, you know, and, um, you know, who I am and my growing up and my struggles that I have. I definitely think that that is probably going to be something that I work on for the rest of my life. I've grown immensely, but I still struggle with that. I mean, maybe God will take it away one day completely. I don't know, but I'm, I, I work on it every day. Um, Jesus was saying that his listeners needed a different kind of righteousness altogether. Love and obedience. I don't love people. Shannon does not love people. Shannon is not obedient at all. Um, Shannon is not loving at all. But I asked God... I don't know, 10, whatever, years ago to help me to love people because I really didn't like people. I don't like people. People are horrible. Um, they hurt. I've been hurt so much in my life. I don't trust people. I don't allow people in. I don't, you know, because I've been hurt so much. People suck. And however many years ago, I had said, you know, I'm, I'm lonely, God. I, I, I don't like people. I don't trust people. I don't, but I'm lonely. I, I want friends. I want to have relationships with people. I want to look at them the way that you look at them rather than the way that I look at them through hurt eyes and disappointed eyes and uh, broken heart eyes and help me to see people how you see people. I asked him that and I asked him to break my heart for what breaks his heart and he has really, really worked on me over the past, you know, 10 or so years and that... I still don't like people, but I love people through Christ. Christ loves people through me. I'm still the broken Shannon that is broken. Um, but Christ loves through me and... I genuinely look at people through his eyes and try to every day rather than through my eyes. Because I wouldn't be very nice through my eyes. So, um, that's a day, again, a daily for me. Um, let's see, we did, yeah. 
yeah, a different kind of righteousness altogether, love and obedience. And that's where I stopped and went on that little tangent there. Not just a more intense version of the Pharisee's righteousness, legal compliance. Our righteousness must, number one, come from God. Come from what God does in us. What I was just, what I was just saying. Not what we can do by ourselves. I can't do it by myself. I can't. I've been too hurt and disappointed by human beings my whole entire life. I can't do it through me. I can't. Um, my heart's been broken way too much. I can't, I cannot do it. I do it. God, no, I don't. God does it through me. Be God-centered and not self-centered. We are a self-centered people. Um, we have to choose daily to be God-centered and not self-centered. serve God, do what God wants us to do rather than what we want, how we want, what we want, how we feel. Um, number three, be based on reverence for God. Uh, there's not a whole lot of that going on in our world today. Reverence for God There's more approval from man than there is seeking God's approval and fear. God's a just God. I'm, I'm just saying that we should fear God, the creator of the universe. And not the approval of people. Go beyond keeping the law to living by the principles behind the law. When Jesus said, but I tell you, he's not doing away with the law or adding his own beliefs. Rather, he is giving a fuller understanding of why God made that law in the first place. For example, Moses said, you shall not murder. Exodus 20, 13. Jesus taught that we should not even become angry enough to murder. For then we have already committed murder in our heart. The Pharisees read this law and not having literally murdered anyone felt righteous. Yet they were angry enough with Jesus that they would soon plot his death. Though they would not do the dirty work themselves. We miss the intent of God's word when we read his rules for living without trying to understand why he made them. When do you keep God's rules but close your eyes to his intent? Killing is a terrible sin, but anger is a great sin too. I hope we dive into thou shalt not kill. I hope that we get into this during our study because I don't understand it. Because there's... Killing in the Old Testament, like from the get-go. So I don't get it. I don't understand thou shalt not kill. What is the parameter there? Killing is a terrible sin. Okay, killing what? We kill animals to eat, but yet God gave us the animals to eat. So um, he had people kill animals as sacrifice that's killing there was murder that went on in throughout the whole bible and i i hope we dive into it because that is confusing to me not that i want to go and kill i don't want to go and kill anybody i'm just saying i want to understand i want to understand why 
like it just said that, but I tell you, and rather than giving a, uh, he was giving a fuller understanding of why God made the law in the first place. Well, I want to understand God's word. I don't want to just read it. I want to understand it. So that's what I'm, I'm saying. Killing is a terrible sin, but anger is a great sin too, because it also violates God's command to love. Anger, in this case, refers to seething, brooding bitterness against someone. It is a dangerous emotion that always threatens to leap out of control, leading to violence, emotional hurt, increased mental stress, and spiritual damage. Anger keeps us from developing a spirit pleasing to God. Have you ever been proud that you didn't strike out to say what you what really was on your mind? Oh yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. Self-control is good, but Christ wants us to practice thought control as well. As well. I've been working on that as well, controlling my thoughts. Um I'm I'm telling you, it's simple. It's um it's just very simple. Um, when I start thinking about things that I shouldn't be thinking about or um, thoughts that are not positive, that are not um, something I should be thinking or I know that they're destructive or from Satan, um, I just start praising God. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just literally start praising and worshiping him with my tongue um, and sometimes out loud. Um, so those thoughts that are permeating that I know that I should not be thinking or that are poisonous or um, not positive or, you know, whatever that it is. Just the simple words of praising God work. They just, they do. They always have for me. That's um, what I, that's what just what I always do. When I um, get any thoughts of like, <sighs> things are beyond my brain can fathom. And I start like freaking out a little bit. Um, where I would almost say, almost a panic attack. Um I just, I have to direct my thoughts to Jesus and praise him and thank him and start worshiping him. Um, so it takes away from the negative and onto Christ. It works. Try it. It works. Um, Jesus said that we will be held account accountable even for our attitudes. Scary. My attitude has not always been great. I was a little hellion. I was full of anger and frustration growing up, young adult. Um, be careful with your attitudes. Broken relationships can hinder our relationship with God. That is true. If you're concentrating so much on your broken relationship and it takes away from Christ, then you either need to fix that relationship real darn quick or, or you need to just plain and simple. If it takes you away from Christ, it is not from Christ. If we have a problem uh, or grievance with a friend, we should resolve the problem as soon as possible. We are hypocrites if we claim to love God while we hate others. Our attitudes towards others reflect our relationship with God. 1 John 4.20 I truly believe this. I have... <sighs> more broken relationships in my life than than I'd like to admit. But I, Shannon, have strived, pursued to resolve, to mend, to um
have a healthy relationship with those rather than the broken relationships. And um, I haven't always been a good steward with my relationships either. And that's a journey that I'm constantly working on of being a good steward with my mouth, with my attitude, with my anger, with my frustration, with my disappointment, with me, 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 me. How did it make me feel? Well, it means something to me that, well, it hurt me. Well, it, you know, this is how I, you know, me, 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 me. In Jesus' day, someone who couldn't pay a debt was thrown into prison until the debt was paid. Well, how the heck are you supposed to pay the debt in prison? <laughs> Unless someone came to pay the debt for the prisoner, he or she would probably die there. Well, duh. How are you supposed to make money in prison? I mean, like legit. How are you supposed to make money in prison? So it's like a... No resolution. It is a practical advice to resolve our differences with our enemies before their anger causes more trouble. That is the truth. Proverbs 25, 8 through 10. You may not get into a disagreement that takes you to court, but even small conflicts mend more easily if you try to make peace right away. In a broader sense, these verses advise us to get things right with our brothers and sisters before we have to stand before God. So that's, you know, before you die, you need to resolve whatever issues that you have with whoever before you die. What happens when the people don't want to resolve with you? What God knows your heart. And if he knows that you tried, then I think you'll be judged on that as well. The Old Testament law said that it is wrong for a person to have sex with someone other than his or her spouse, Exodus twenty fourteen. But Jesus said that the desire to have sex with someone other than your spouse is mental adultery and thus sin. Jesus emphasized that if the act is wrong, then so is the intention. To be faithful to your spouse with your body, but not your mind, is to break the trust so vital to a strong marriage. <clears throat> Jesus is not condemning natural interest in the opposite sex or even healthy sexual desire, but the deliberate and repeated filing, filling of one's mind with fantasies that would be evil if acted out. Some think that if lustful thoughts are sin, why shouldn't a person go ahead and do the lustful actions too? Who's that some? <laughs> That's funny. It causes people to excuse sin rather than to stop sinning. It destroys marriages. It is deliberate rebellion against God's word. I, I do believe that. I mean, I know I giggled just a minute ago, but it, I mean, it's serious. This is people's souls that you're dealing with. Behave yourself. Control yourself. It always hurts someone else in addition to the sinner. You, you're not the only one involved. So... Sinful actions is more dangerous than sinful desire. And that is why desires should not be acted out. Nevertheless, sinful desires is just as damaging to righteousness. So even though you do not act, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't act out your fantasies, the thoughts that have entered your brain, the time that you have given them, the space, the rent that you have allowed them to be in there has contaminated your righteousness. Left unchecked, 
wrong desires will result in wrong actions and turn people away from God. If you're having any desires that are opposite of Christ, get some accountability right now. Tell somebody, whoever that is who you trust, you need to tell somebody and hold yourself accountable and have them hold you accountable before you do something that you're going to regret. When Jesus said to get rid of your hand or your eye, he was speaking figuratively. (laughs) Thank goodness he didn't mean literally. He didn't mean literally to gouge out your eye. Thank you, Jesus. Because even a blind person can lust. Hmm. If you already have the images in your mind, if you've had. Now I'm just now I'm just being. Me. So if you've had the images with view and then you gouge out your eye obviously you have those images in there but if you were always blind how could you have those images because you never saw those images i wonder how that works but if there were the only choice it would be better to go into heaven with one eye or hand than go to go to hell with two yes I agree. We sometimes tolerate sins in our lives that left unchecked could eventually destroy us. It is better to experience the pain of removal, getting rid of that bad habit or something we treasure, for instance, than to allow it, the sin to bring judgment and condemnation. Examine your life for anything that causes you to sin and take every necessary action to remove it. Every. Divorce is a hurtful and destruct and is divorce is as hurtful and destructive today as in Jesus's day. God intends marriage to be a lifetime commitment. Genesis two twenty four. When entering into marriage, people should never consider divorce an option for solving problems or a way out of a relationship that seems dead. In these verses, Jesus is also attacking those who purposefully abuse the marriage contract, using divorce to satisfy their lustful desire to marry someone else. Are you, are your actions today helping your marriage grow stronger or are they tearing it apart? Jesus said that divorce is not permissible except for unfaithfulness. This does not mean that divorce should automatically occur when a spouse commits adultery. The word translated unfaithfulness implies a sexual immoral lifestyle, not a confessed or repented act of adultery. Those who discover that their partner has been unfaithful should first make every effort to forgive, reconcile, and restore their relationship. We are always to look for reasons to restore the marriage relationship rather than for excuses to leave it. Here Jesus was emphasizing the importance of telling the truth. People were breaking promises and using sacred language casually and carelessly. That goes on today as well. Keeping oaths and promises is an important, it builds trust and makes committed human relationships possible. How good is your word? Are you a trustworthy person? The Bible condemns making vows or taking oaths casually, giving your word while knowing that you won't keep it, or swearing falsely in God's name, Exodus 20, verse 7, Leviticus 19, 12, Numbers 31 and 2, Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 20, Oaths are needed in certain situations only because we live in a sinful society that breeds distrust. Oaths or vows were common, but Jesus told his followers not to use them. Their word alone should be enough. See James 5, 12. Are you known as a person of your word? Truthfulness seems so rare that we feel we must end our statement with, I promise if we tell the truth all the time, we have less pressure to back up our words with an oath 
or a promise. God's purpose behind this law was an expression of mercy. The law was given to judge and said, in effect, make the punishment fit the crime. It was not a guide for pers personal revenge. Exodus 21, 23 through 25, Leviticus 24, 19 and 20, Deuteronomy 19, 21. These laws were given to limit vengeance and help the court administer punishment that was neither too strict nor too lenient. Some people, however, were using this phrase to justify their vendettas against others. People still try to excuse their acts of revenge by saying, I was just doing to him what he did to me. When we are wronged, often our first reaction is to get even. Instead, Jesus said we should do good to those who wrong us. Our desires should not be to keep score, but to love and forgive. This is not natural. It is not. You have to ask God to do it through you. Only through God. It is supernatural. Only God can give us the strength to love as he does. Instead of planning vengeance, pray for those who hurt you. To many Jews of Jesus' day, these statements were offensive any Messiah who would turn the other cheek was not the military leader. They wanted to lead a revolt against Rome. Since they were under Roman oppression, they wanted retaliation against their enemies, whom they hated. But Jesus suggested a new radical response to injustice. Instead of demanding rights, give them up freely. According to Jesus, it is more important to give justice and mercy than to receive it. By telling us not to retaliate, Jesus keeps us from taking the law into our own hands. By loving and praying for our enemies, we can overcome evil with good. The Pharisees interpreted Leviticus 19.18 as teaching that they should love only those who love in return. And Psalm 139, 19 through 22 and 140, 9 through 11 as meaning that they should hate their enemies. But Jesus says we are to love our enemies. If you love your enemies and treat them well, you will truly show that Jesus is the Lord of your life. This is possible only to those who give themselves fully to God because only he can deliver people from natural selfishness. Only God. We must trust the Holy Spirit to help us show love for those for whom we may not feel love. How can we be perfect? In character, in this life we cannot be flawless, but we can aspire to be much like Christ as possible. In holiness, like the Pharisees, we are to separate ourselves from the world's sinful values, but unlike the Pharisees, we are to be devoted to God's desires rather than our own and carry his love and mercy into the world. In maturity, we can't achieve Christ-like character and holy living all at once, but we must grow toward maturity, maturity and wholeness. Just as we expect different behavior from a baby, baby a child, a teenager, and an adult, so God expects different behavior from us, depending on our, on our stage of spiritual development. In love, we can seek to love others as completely as God loves us. We can be perfect if our behavior is appropriate for our maturity level. Perfect, yet with much room to grow, our tendency to sin must never deter us from striving to be more like Christ. Christ calls all of his disciples to excel, to rise above mediocrity, and to mature in every area, becoming like him. Those who strive to become perfect will one day be perfect, even as Christ is perfect. 1 John 3, 2, and 3. I say all the time, I am not perfect. I am not perfect. I am not perfect. I strive to be Christ-like. And that concludes the notes for Matthew 5. Wow. We're almost at an hour and a half. And I haven't even gotten to 
some. I have two pages in front of me now. Mm. Psalm 6. Yeah, if it's Psalm 5, I'll, I'll go back. I forgot what day I was doing. I don't know if I'm doing 5 or 6. But if I'm doing 5, five then or um six i'll just do them flip-flop today and tomorrow so let's see here we go um, the secret of a close relationship with god is to pray to him earnestly each morning the morning is hard for me i am not a morning person so, can it be every day? So, whenever is good for us, does it have to be in the morning? In the morning, our minds are more free from problems. In the morning, I'm not even awake. So, I I think you can do it anytime. I don't know that whatever works for you and your journey. In the morning, our minds are more free from problems and then we can commit the whole day to God. I do agree with that. If you're a morning person, do it in the morning and then you're set for the rest of the day. But if that doesn't work for you, which it, it usually doesn't for me, first thing in the morning, um, it takes me a while to wake up. I am not a morning person. I'm a night person. So first thing in the morning, getting right in, I'm just, my brain just is... Too slow for me to get into any type of making me think first thing in the morning. Um, regular communication helps any friendship and is certainly necessary for a strong relationship with God. We need to communicate with him daily. Agree? Amen. Do you have regular time to pray and read God's word? Well, we're doing that now. So... Kudos to us. God cannot condone or excuse even the smallest sin. Therefore, we cannot excuse ourselves for sitting, sinning only a little bit. As we grow spiritually, our sensitivity to sin increases. That is true. I have grown a sensitivity towards it as I've gotten older and my relationship is stronger with Christ. My sensitivity to spirituality and good and evil and to do and not to do and all that has increased as I've grown. What is your reaction to sin in your life? Are you insensitive, unconcerned, disappointed, or comfortable? As God makes us aware of sin, we must be intolerant towards it and willing to change. All believers should strive to be more tolerant of people, but less tolerant of the sin in others and in themselves. So we more tolerant of people, but less tolerant of the sin. You know, I, I believe that is what he, Christ does through me what I was talking about that I see people through God's eyes rather than my own eyes. I, I feel like that's like a correlation there. This is the first of seven penitential psalm Oh, wait a minute, that goes into that goes into six. So that's the end of five. And I want to go to Psalm 91 and read the notes again. I know I've read these before, but I'm going to do it again. Psalm 91, God is a shelter, a refuge when we are afraid. The writer's faith in the almighty God as protector would carry him through all the dangers and fears of life. Amen. This should be a picture of our trust, trading all our fear, 
trading all of our fears for faith in him, no matter how intense our fears. To do this, we must dwell and rest with him by entrusting ourselves to his protection and pledging our daily devotion to him, we will be kept safe. One of the functions of angels is to watch over believers. Hebrew 1, 14. There are examples of guardian angels in scripture. 1 Kings 19, 5. Daniel 6, 22. Matthew 18, 10. Luke 16, 22. Acts 12, 7. Although there is no indication that one angel is assigned to each believer, angels can also be God's messengers. Matthew 2, 2 13, Acts 27, 23, and 24. Angels are not visible except on special occasions. Numbers 22, 31, Luke 2, 9, verse, verses 11 and 12 were quoted by Satan when he tempted Jesus, Matthew 4, 6, Luke 4, 10, and 11. It is comforting to know that God watches over us even in times of great stress and fear. Amen. Alrighty, my friends. That was a long one today. We're at an hour and a half. So I'm going to conclude this. And thank you for joining me. Thank you for diving in. Um, thank you for going on this journey with me this year in 2022. I'm excited to see uh, what God does with this. And shoot me any messages, questions, additions, um, thoughts. Uh, if you need a Bible, let me know. I'll send you a Bible. If you need prayer, let me know. I will pray for you, with you. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, let me know. I'll tell you about him. He's pretty cool. And I think that's about it. We covered a lot today. I'm so proud of you for continuing this journey uh, with me and reading through the Bible. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this and I'm excited about it. Okay, I'm going to say peace out. God bless.